So on that note, um, I'm absolutely delighted to have uh, to welcome the inimitable uh, Pepe Marais uh, as our as our speaker this evening, and, um, and and to unpack a very large subject, which is purpose, um, and his tagline of the anti serum to any crisis. Um, any any Henley MBAs here? Uh, if you if you were lucky enough to attend Chris Dalton's personal development classes. Would already be in, in the in the abstract of um, of meaning, values, and purpose, and I have no doubt that um, Pepe is going to instantiate the abstract for us into some practical tools and models and ways to think about purpose and, and stuff we can do as we walk out of his session. Um, in terms of introduction, I feel like Pepe doesn't really need an introduction because he's so much part of the Hindi community. But for for any of you who don't know. I'll just give you a little snapshot. <clears throat> He's a celebrated author of two books, um, and uh, the first being um, uh, Growing Greatness, A Journey Towards Personal and Business Mastery, and then a follow-up book, I think two years later, called 20 Habits That Break Habits. And I, I totally recommend that you get hold of both of these books. Um, Pepe is the group chief creative officer and founding partner of the um, the, the highly celebrated uh, brand and communication group, Joe Puck United. And um, you might remember his standout session during the 21 lessons uh, uh, sessions that we had in uh, over, I think, March and April in 2020 in the height of the, the lockdown. Um, for me, that was a, it was an absolute standout in the series and a large region, a large reason why we went to Pepe today to, um, to join us. And he's, he's very graciously given us the time. So I've got to say that going back to my music industry days, I have this vision of a queue of people trying to get into the room because the, I, can, I can hear, the, I can hear the, the, the doorbell buzzing all the time. So it's it, it hard to have, to have that vision. So Pepe, you're, you've, you've broken all records, box office records. Um, I'm, not, I'm going to stop talking now and hand over to, to you, uh, Pepe. Thanks, thanks again for joining us. And uh, I'm really excited with, with what you're going to share with us tonight. So over to you and welcome. Thank you so much, Barry. And um, fortunately, I remembered to, to, to demute. Um, if I can ask, just again, if everyone could just double check that you're on mute. Um, I'm going to try. I have not timed this presentation. It is very much on the same subject matter as last year. Maybe a couple of new thoughts, because obviously a lot has happened since last year. Um, so I'd probably talk, I'm going to try and aim for 35 minutes. I'll do my best. I get a little bit distracted sometimes. Um, hence, I use slides to, to, to pace my talking. Otherwise, I can talk to you, you know, I'm an advertising after all. Um, so, so, so I'm going to get going. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. And I'm not coming in under the flag of, of our business tonight. I'm coming in under my flag of purpose advocate. So everyone I assume can see my screen. Just shout if it doesn't, if it doesn't go. Can see it perfectly. Yeah. Okay, I just want to see quickly what's happening here. There we go. There we go. So the world is upside down at the moment. There's no doubt. Um, completely and utterly disrupted. I even said today to one of my team members, you know, we, we're giving it our best shot and we, we're really thriving in this tough time. But, but I think it's just our resilient nature as, as human beings, not just South Africans, to take it on the chin. But I, I'm, I'm thinking this must be what it felt like in World War II. You know, like it's like the world at war. Um, so uh, something I'm very passionate about and my experience in the corporate world, because of course we deal with big corporate clients um, in our organization, is this thing of the bottom line, which ironically is called the bottom line, as that, that's become a top priority. And of course, this has been long before COVID, but, but I think together with COVID, this is creating quite a, a, a context and a lot of stress in our world, this obsession with quarter to quarter growth. 
you know. I, I, I love this saying. I'd like to think I coined it, but I don't know where I got it from. So it's open source, wherever things come from. But, you know, plan for the first quarter century rather than the first quarter. Like we so short-termism, you know, in this world that we live in. Like Milton Friedman, if, you do, if you've done your MBA, you might have come across him in the 70s. He was actually a, a, a very famous economist that won a Nobel Peace Prize for economics who professed that business exists to make profit, you know, and it was only, I think, in the 80s where another chap, a professor by the name of Freeman, I'm just quickly going to ask, there's someone there that's not muted. Thanks, thanks, guys. So Freeman in the 80s, I find that also interesting how the world works. You've got like Friedman that goes, business exists to make profit, and it's all about shareholders, and then in the next decade, a guy by the name of Freeman starts bringing out this notion business exists for stakeholders. So there's all this debate that's been going on for years. I took my, my son and my wife on our way to Europe a few years ago um, through Egypt because he was studying Egypt that year. He was, I think, grade five. They were doing Egypt. I wanted to show him the pyramids. And I was so fascinated when I stood at the Great Pyramid of Giza and our guide was explaining to me the sort of little bit of insights behind it, you know, 3 million blocks. These blocks are like the size of a big SUV and they're one and a half tons each. And this was apparently built by 150,000 slaves. And I stood there and I just thought that's amazing. It's all for the benefit of one king. And I thought that's, that's 6,000 years ago, the pyramid system where everyone works for the benefit of one was existed. It's almost like the capitalistic system today which we still live in. And it seems we've made life all about logic. You know? So it's all about the brain. It's all about this logic. And we've completely forgotten the magic. And I suppose I really am passionate about this because I'm in such a creative field. Um, I call myself an artist. I'm a, I'm a graphic artist, a visual artist, a filmmaker, a music maker. So I'm very much in the art forms where, where we operate on, on the heart and we operate with magic. And then in this business world, the world of commerce and short-term profits and market growth at all costs, it seems to be all about the head. You know, so all head, no heart. And this, this world we've created makes it feel sometimes like we're pushing this massive mammoth rock up this hill and it's quite daunting and i see you know after i shake hands with ceos and i can feel their hands are sweating you know that's not a good sign that's not a sign of a happy person um because that's a sign of stress and duress and a very very brave face and then of course COVID 19 is this context that's overlaid onto it um that really really has just compounded this world that we live in. The question I ask, though, you know, if I, because we live, we, we tend to be very captured in our micro lives, you know, within our own life and everything in the lens we see our lives through and all my conditionings that make me see the world the way I see it. And may I just say, while I'm talking about lenses and conditionings, everything that I say is just a point of view. It's not necessarily the truth. It may be my truth. Um, and my experience of the world. And there might be someone else with a profound experience that's completely the opposite. Um, just, just to make that little point. Um, but I do ask myself whether COVID-19 is here to teach me how to push the boundaries of my life. Like, like, am I really doing the most that I can do with my life? Is this massive challenge coming here to create maybe more consciousness? Will it teach me to stop pushing against nature. I've, I've become very aware. I spent lockdown on the Vaal River where I presented from last year. I'm back in Bryanston now. And I remember one September, like on the money, all the trees just popped, just the abundance of nature, this just green everywhere from this dead, desolate plain across the river, suddenly just abundant green, the, the color of money. And I thought, it's so interesting how we struggle to thrive financially. But I'm not sure if we approach the making of money 
in a natural way. I think we do it quite unnaturally because we try to make money. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. And what do I need to go to go more with nature's flow? You know, how do I go more with nature's flow? How do I operate even in this very capitalistic world, which I believe in as a system? I believe in it. I just believe more in conscious capitalism, which is a which is a a movement started by the CEO of Whole Foods in America called John Mackey, profound CEO. Um, so I believe that it should be approached with more consciousness. And I'll touch on the slide in the end to make that point. I love Braveheart. I've seen this movie 15 times now, three hours and 20 minutes of it. Um, I don't know why I'm so attracted to it. I think it's because, because William Wallace fought against injustice. And when I say that fought against injustice, I'm reminded of, do you become anti-war or pro-peace? Because they both fight for the same thing. The one's just got a more negative energy and the other one's got a more positive energy, you know, but the sort of injustice. And I looked at injustice and I realized, but, but the world we perceive is so full of injustice. There's just so much injustice, but maybe, it just is as it is. And maybe everything is just. Maybe everything is happening at a macro level, miraculously to move us into places where we wouldn't go naturally because we do not like change. You know, if someone said two years ago in our organization, if someone had to propose, let's work from home two weeks a month and then two weeks a month from work and save half our rent, we would have laughed that person out of the boardroom. Are you mad? You can't trust people. You can't work from home. People will just take, like, <laughs> they won't work. They won't, they lose focus. Like, and look at us today, fully functioning, operating to high levels of effectivity and efficiency, working 100% of the time from home. So, but it took this huge crisis to make that shift. So maybe COVID is there to show humanity a new way. You know, maybe it's there to really make us reassess how we live our lives. So I'm going to touch on this notion of purpose now, this anti-serum to any crisis, because my experience has taught me that, that this, this is the way. It's my way, so not necessarily every single person's, not, not every single person's cup of tea. But this is definitely resonated with me, this little journey of discovering purpose. And when I think about it, it might have resonated to this level because I'm in marketing. We deal with business strategy. We deal with marketing. Well, we're exposed to business strategies because all we do in marketing is align the marketing to the business strategy, whether you work on breweries, net bank, whichever big corporation. Um, but but I think I resonated so much with this approach because I'm strategic. I love strategy. And, and I also in marketing, there's a, there's a couple of terms that resonated. So, so this is for me the move from headspace, maybe not completely into heart space, but to find that balance between head and heart, not just be in from the head, to find that, that balance, that wisdom, that line in the middle of these two visuals between magic and logic. That to me is true wisdom, is, is, is the mix of both. But I wanna just make some points on the power of heart space. This is a picture I drew of my first girlfriend who I fell in love with when I was 16. And she was out of my league. She was a gymnast. She was one of the cool kids at school. She was English. I was a Dutchman, Afrikaner, couldn't speak English, big ears, skinny. There was no way I could win her heart. But my gut told me to draw a face on a chicken egg. So I stole a chicken egg from my mother's. Well, I didn't steal it. I just took it. Um, what's the difference between taking it or eating it? So I took a chicken egg and I drew a face on the egg. And I gave it to her at break time. Like she didn't know me from a bar of soap. I just walked up to her and I, I said, I made you this gift. And I gave her a face drawn on the chicken egg. 
and somehow this made the school take notice of me and and we became friends and and lovers it was amazing you know in end of standard nine the trick finding the love of my life and many years later there's a lot that happened in between that moment and today but 35 years later we the parents of a 13 year old boy he's a bit younger and i think he was about seven or eight in this picture so this is the result of that little chicken egg now i don't know if who in this sort of session has got children but if i had to tell you i want your child how much money must i pay you no one no, people will say no money in the world you can't have my child if i put a gun against your head and i say put put a value on your child's head put a value on your child's head people can't but if i really had to put a value on i'll say well maybe five billion rand maybe i mean it won't be enough ever maybe 10 billion so as i'm sitting here i'm a multi-billionaire because i'm worth billions because that's what my son is worth in fact even more trillions and that's the result of an act of the heart a chicken egg you know created that much value no logic no overthinking on instinct i've just connected with another human being and we created another human being that's invaluable and as we all are here we are each children of someone else we are, we carry that same value within us but we still strive for for the money which is super important and i'll touch on that as well another little incident that happened in 1997 is this idea of takeaway advertising can one start an advertising agency that's based on a takeaway rec restaurant model and it was such a powerful thought like a takeaway restaurant where we've got a menu with rare medium and well done ideas and a menu with rare medium and well done executions and we'll charge for our ideas and not for hours like if it takes five minutes to come up with an idea you pay that price on the menu and this got us to start a business we didn't write a business plan um we were not yeah, i think if we wrote a business plan the way we taught nowadays to write business plans we did a pestle analysis and all the good stuff i think we would never have started the business we just followed our guts and 23 years later we have got this incredible um incredible business like uh, i'm so proud of it it doesn't feel like mine i feel like i work for it it feels like my child and we never own our children otherwise we enslave them so i work for this business and when i think about it we don't ever get butterflies between our ears you know we get butterflies in our tummies so you you get butterflies when you're nervous like i'm always nervous when i have to do a talk so i get butterflies and i drink water yeah, you know, I, I take the water and I drown my butterflies. You know, it just keeps me on my toes. Never between my ears. I've never, ever experienced butterflies between my ears. When that girl that fell in love with me and my rip-roaring affair in matric that severely affected my matric mark and didn't get me a university exemption. <laughs> so, you know, that was the cost of love. She left me at the end of matric. I didn't have a headache. I didn't have a headache. No amount of panados, the GP's choice, could actually have solved my heart attack. My heart ached. It really ached. And that's the power, the point I'm making, is probably the two biggest decisions in my life. My partner, my life partner, and my business partner in business are two absolute acts of the heart. And that's the power of the heart. My own personal COVID crisis happened back in 2006. It was profound. I had this, I come from a, a, a racist home. Um, it's old South Africa. What do you expect if you're Afrikaans, white Afrikaner? That was the context I was brought up in. You know, it's, it's a conditioning. It's not necessary. You're not born a racist. <laughs> you know, I think we're born all pretty pure. But depending on where you're born into, you pick up belief systems that, that lives in that house and it's probably belief systems learned from other people. And it took me more than a decade of getting into a very alternative industry to, to, to get myself out of that conditioning. And once I got out of that conditioning, probably only by the age of 22, 32, 32, 33, 
And there's always reminisce and judgments and lenses from that deep conditioning that I have to work on to this day. But I, I remember a guy working for us who was a racist and I was not going to tolerate it. So I fired him on the freaking spot. He was a senior executive and I was not going to tolerate it within our business because I worked so hard to get away from that conditioning. And now we had an executive in our business that behaved like that. And he went to work for our biggest client and he fired us three months later. And we pretty much lost our business overnight. 50% of our business wiped out overnight from zero to zero, one foul swoop based on integrity, an act of integrity. And at that stage, I remember a lot of things in my life was falling apart. So the business I worked so hard for started falling apart. My relationship started falling apart. I was working extreme hours, but then in my spare time, I was just, I wouldn't say I was an alcoholic, but I drank a lot. You know, party hard, work hard, life of the party. And I wanted to make money and I wasn't making money at all. I was going to make money. The money was not there. I still, I'll never forget, I often share it. Um, I wanted to own a yacht at the age of 50 and sail the world and retire. And I remember my financial advisor saying, you don't have enough money to even afford a rubber duck. So I went on this deep dive, introspection, measured the aspects of my life. I don't know what made me measure the aspects of my life. Today, I'm a huge measurer of all aspects of my life. I love measurement. Measurement drives consciousness. And I measured my health my family, my business, my finance, and I had a little corporate social investment. And, and I realized I'm netting out at below 50%. For someone who gives 110%, well, you can't give 110%, but I was giving 90% and I'm talented and good at what I do. And my, my, my output of all my efforts is like nothing. And hence, I went on a very, very profound search for meaning to life very profound and fascinating to me that it takes it takes me to go into the deepest darkest place in my life to go and look for the light whereas all the years before i was just the life of the party fun you know mr fun joy all fake of course not true inside i was completely insecure and and um, an anxious but on that day 12th of January 2017, 2007, which is 14 years ago, I found my life's purpose. And what's fascinating, it came in one word. One powerful word. And when I started to live this word, and I'll, and I'll unpack the meaning of that word a bit later. And I made it my strategy. Like it came in such a profound way. And that's why I'm saying, I think because in marketing, I've experienced the power of one word in marketing strategy. So this idea of purpose being one word and that I stand for one word, my, my most highest order value made me move from one city to an entirely new city. And I'm quoting here from a beautiful book called The Art of Possibility. I moved from scarcity to generosity. I moved from operating in service of myself and my own dreams and my need to make money to show that I'm good enough, to show that I'm successful, all about my ego. Um, I moved from that into a service of other people. It, it's subtle, it's not, it wasn't something that was done overtly. It wasn't done to say, look at me, I'm helping someone. It was completely quiet, an inner shift moving from the scarce behavior of in it for myself to this absolutely with all my heart into the city of generosity where I give, I avail as much of myself to others in service of them, not of myself. And what I experienced over a period of two years, because there was such a shift. I mean, I used to wear bells on the toes of my shoes. I mean, I used to have long hair. And like really creative looking flamboyant guy. My business didn't do flamboyant amazing work, but I sure as hell looked creative. But what I experienced in two years is all that aspects of my life naturally just started to improve. 
on very much the same effort, very abundant. And I thought, this is so interesting. You know, the saying, seeing, or what, what the saying is, um, the more you give, the more you get. Like, it, 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 it's so profound, as long as you don't give to get. Because I think if you give to get, the system catches you out. The system, this incredible system we live in, which none of us know what's going on, really. And hopefully, when I die, there's going to be a bit of a aha moment, and somehow someone's going to tell me exactly how this thing works. But in my experience, when you give not to get anything back, life goes into flow. Fascinating, a fascinating, and I can I can honestly say I've experienced it because I've come from bankruptcy ten years ago, from having nothing. So of course I wrote my first book, put everything in the book. In essence, at the heart of the story is this obsession with being human. You know, we get our human birth name. Tapelo, Jennifer, Golani, Pepe. It's what we do. You know, we're in it for the material, the car we drive, what job we have, what home we live in, where do my kids go to school, um, where do we go on holiday, how, how can I make more money, how can I serve myself? Very important, critical to life, because this is how we sustain ourselves. You know, you have to first sustain yourself before you can help others. So this is very, very important. I'm not taking anything away from this way of being. But it's 50% of life. When I did the little mathematical equation, and I went, you know what? I'm an 80% plus person. I'm a high performance individual. Except for that matric year when I met the girl. But in general, I'm a high performance individual. So if I'm an 80% plus, but I'm living a 50% life, my only output can be in the area of 40%. And I did this mathematical sum, and I thought that made sense, sense to me. And on the other side of this equation is the image of God. So the image of man, and I'm not saying this in any religious context. I'm just saying a, highest, a higher order that's definitely in this world. I died in... 1995, I drowned. I experienced death, near death, because, because I'm obviously I'm here. Um, it's a fascinating story. <laughs> Barry, if, if I ever do it part two, I must bring that story into it. Magnificent story. My drowning incident, I drowned. And, and it, it, it's just so, you know, that saying that even the atheists find God when they face death is actually proof that there is something bigger. So, so yes, there's a lot of people that believe in God, but, you know, seeing is believing. Although I believe believing is seeing, and I'll say it later on in the presentation, but, but that experience exposed me to something so magnificent, and I got out of it, and I, and, I, and I got a second chance in life. Funny that I only woke up 13 years later. You know, I had, a, I had a bit of a wake-up call and I only woke up 13 years later. But there's this other dimension to each and every one of us, which is called the being, because we're human beings. We're not just humans. We're human beings. So there's a human side, the being side. So just like we each have a human name, we each have a being name, one word for each of us, our birthright, which is our greater cause, our reason for being. Why are we on this planet? And when you become conscious of this, because it's deep in our unconscious, it's there. I can guarantee you it's in every single person in this meeting, in this present, everyone here in this virtual room. You have got an inner reason for being and you're not even aware of what it is. If you ever discover it, you could potentially double your output without doing any more effort, just by a shift in intention. It's very much like a tree. The human name for tree is tree, T-R-E-E. -E. But the being name could be life because it makes oxygen. Or it could be shelter because it gives shelter to small little animals. And I think if people understood the purpose of trees better, they will be less likely to destroy them. So, so that's just a means of demonstration of this belief that I've discovered. Um, which is a very strong belief. I'm not dogmatic. I often change my views, but this is one view that I don't think I'll ever change in my life. 
Jane Goodall said, just like humans are human beings, monkeys are monkey beings, and cats are cat beings, and do dogs are dog beings, and hence I became a vegan. Don't necessarily recommend it, um, but it worked for me because I just couldn't eat other beings anymore. And I asked myself back then, when I read this article on Jane, can a business be a business being? This was pre Simon Sinek, who's done incredible work in this space on, on purpose for business. The why, start with the why. Why do I exist? This was circa 2008, 2009. Can a business be a business being? Can a business have one word at its core, a reason for being beyond money? So it's a sort of thought process I went through. Can a business have a purpose beyond its product and service? Because we tend to think that we exist to make money, or if not, then for the product or the service that we offer. That's the purpose of my business. And I started interrogating these things. And how I can demonstrate this is if I had a beauty shop that, 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 that did makeovers for, let's say for women, nails, hair, facials, if you ask me what's my purpose, I might say my purpose is beauty because my product is beauty. I'm selling beauty. What is your one word your business stand for? I might say beauty. But if I interrogate you a little bit deeper, you might find in the conversation that you speak to your customers and sometimes they come in and they don't feel good enough. But after you've given them a makeover and you pamper them, they leave with a higher self-esteem. And you realize your business might be self-esteem. And once you know you're in the business of self-esteem, the way you sell your business, the way you come to business, the way you arrive at business is so much deeper than just beauty. Or of course it can be beauty too. It depends on the business, but this is just an explanation or sort of a, a bit of an example of the subtle nuance between what you think you are at face value and who you truly are within whether you're a person or business. So I asked the question in Joe Public at that stage, we were 30 people, broke us up in teams of six, it took me six months. One person actually resigned. I don't come to work to find my purpose. I'm not gonna work at this hippie place. But the other 29 stood it through. And we found our purpose is growth. Um, and I'm conscious of the time, I'm 35 minutes. And I've still got a little bit to go. Um, so I'm not going to do this. I wanted to engage a little bit. So this is a very, very important aspect. This one word is not the purpose, but it's that you need to find this name, this inner being, the core of you, to extrapolate your purpose. As an example, if I take the color red, if I right now ask each of you to think the first thought that comes to mind, if I say the color red, if I had time, and if I had five people to answer, I will hear apple, fire engine, passion, love, um, stop sign. I'll, I'll hear all these different definitions, but I ask you the color red. So you realize that you can't just have a word and say, that's my purpose you need to define what that word means. That's critical. So once we found growth, we took the time to actually define exactly what growth means. Because you go, well, you're in business. Of course you want to grow. No. The purpose of Joe Public United, our child, my firstborn, bricks and mortar son, is to be the fertile soil that grows our people, our clients, and our country. Not any soil, fertile soil. There it's in our empty building. There's a couple of people there. It's an old picture. It's standing empty for the last 18 months. To be the fertile soil that grows our people, our clients, and our country. We put this at the core of the business in 2010, coming out of bankruptcy, coming out of the 2008, 2009 recession. And we made this our strategy. We made this our core strategy. We took the bottom line, which used to be our obsession. We want to make money. And we replaced it with purpose. 
And we made sure that we created a vision based on purpose because business books teach us start your business with vision. In my book, it's not the truth because vision in the absence of purpose is often self-serving and small. But if you have a purpose in service of others and you then create a vision, your vision becomes much bigger and much more in service. And the more you give, the more you get. And it then informs your values. It attracts different people. It creates a different product. It changes long-term goals. It changes short-term goals. You start planning for the first quarter century. You start thinking 25 years into the future. You start honing your systems aligned to this and your strategy and your marketing and your PR and you do all these things. You do them first with all your heart and you start experiencing an abundant bottom line. Abundant. It, 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 it just fascinates me where I find myself 10 years later. Um, it, it, it dumbfounds me and it's why I'm so passionate to share this insight because it so profoundly shifted my life to this business, which for the last four or three, three years has been number one in our industry, which is, which is no mean feat for a small, smaller player against the bigger, bigger agencies to be number one firmly and to know that we're only at the beginning after 23 years. We're only going into adulthood. So out of the 41,000 listed organizations in the world, roughly, I can't find almost anyone with absolute clarity on what they stand for. I can find a lot of insight on what they say they believe in. So Nike is to bring inspiration, innovation to every athlete in the world. But if I ask people outside of the brand, what's the one word they stand for? I don't know if people will say inspiration or maybe innovation or what they'll say. It's not that clear. They've clearly got a mission beyond money. Full Nights book, Shoe Dog, I referenced just now, magnificent read. If I look at Apple, not the latest statement, because now um, Steve's gone. But if I look at the founder statement, to make a contribution to the world by making tools for the mind that have advanced humankind, massive. But again, was the purpose contribution or advance was it, was it a, you know, and, and I'm definitely not pointing finger here at the most like, I mean, this must be one of the top three brands in the world. And our own South African born um, founder of Tesla to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Beautiful, beautiful purpose, if it is a purpose. Beautiful reason for being for business. But are they here to accelerate? Are they here to transition or are they here to create sustainability? So, so, so I think there's an opportunity because once you can create something that people from the outside say, that's what they stand for. And funny enough, I can find only two brands in the world that does that. The one is Volvo. If I have to pull a sample size, I've never done it. People will go safety. If I go Woolworths, a lot of people in this group will go quality. And if you look back at Max Sonnenberg's statement it was to provide customers with superior superior quality products at reasonable prices so here i am born into a crazy very um disfortunate position 53 years ago drunken lunatic crazy father tried to shoot us lots of violence started working at the age of 12 fell in love at 16 heartbroken suffered for 22 years from severe social phobia that I couldn't present to people. I was an introvert, creative being, couldn't go out to malls, couldn't go to dinners, would sweat when I get like anxiety or anxious, it will show on my face, founded a business, poured my heart into it, bankrupt at 40, building it up to the top of this country at the moment, firmly feet on the ground, COVID-19 comes, this huge stormy ocean. And I realize I've discovered the rudder. I've discovered the rudder and it's one word. The profound impact of purpose has not only been on my business, it's been on my life. It's been profound. And in fact, it's become the strategy for my life. 
it's my life strategy. I find it so interesting. Businesses have strategy, but as human beings, we don't have strategy. We don't have a we don't have a plan. We work weekend weekend to weekend because that's what I used to do. And I used to smoke for 18 years, and smoking kills. It says on the box, and I'll read it, and I'll smoke. And we say knowledge is power, but knowledge is not power. Smoking kills is the knowledge. The power is applying the knowledge. So of course, it's one thing to talk purpose. And the world is talking purpose massively. You can go and Google purpose. You'll get a thousand articles and you'll get hundreds of McKinsey studies on purpose for business and the benefits and all the things. But it's not really being lived yet. And hence I say seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. It starts with believing in this methodology. Putting it into your life and start living towards it and you will be fascinated how things will change. What happened over the years is it didn't just shoot up from where I thought 50 to 100. It exponentially went into the thousands of percent, exponentially. My CSI used to raise 10,000 rand a year when I was doing it for my ego. In the first year post purpose, it raised 110,000. The next year, 1.5 million. And a decade later, I was offered a billion rand. And I turned it down because I can't fix education with a billion rand. That's only 47,000 rand per dysfunctional school in South Africa. That's not even one salary per month. Done. All the money gone. But that money was availed. So, so it is fascinating. So in conclusion, if you haven't read this book, do yourself a favor. If you're into business, read this epic story of how this phenomenal brand was created. Towards the end, and Phil wrote this in his 70s, so that must be true wisdom coming through. And he worked 17 years before he made money. So the saying, it takes 17 years to become an overnight success, is indeed true. And incidentally, it took me 17 years to make my first bit of money. So, so it takes 17 years to become an overnight success. But Phil said, we all understand the function of blood in our bodies. If it doesn't flow, you die. So it makes sense. Blood has to flow through our body, bodies to be alive. But if you ask me why do I exist, I don't answer to make blood. So money has to flow through a business. Money is the lifeblood of business. Without money, a business will die. But you do not wake up in the morning thinking you must make blood. So it's a profound insight from one of the greatest business leaders in the world that created one of the greatest brands. And I don't think many people actually even understand it when they read it, but it is so profound. I love Oliver Wendell Holmes um, saying, most of us go to our graves with our music still inside us unplayed because there's this gift in each of us. But in the absence of knowing exactly what it is, you might never experience the true music inside you because what we think is really good is so far from great. And I think sometimes we have it so good that it's good enough and we don't realize what we really can achieve in this world. And then Mark Twain said, the two most important days of your life are the day you are born and the day you find your why. So it's all around us. The information's been there since 600 years before Christ. This thing about purpose has been talked about for more than 2,000 years. And maybe now is the time to ask ourselves, this is the pyramid system in the world, which I believe works, but it works better when the leader sits there. It works much better when the leader is at the bottom of the pyramid in support of all those people that work for us. So the question is, what will it take for us each to lead a life in service of others, truly in service of others? And the question I'll leave you to ponder on, and I've gone a little bit over, is what is your reason for being? A very, very good question to, to start asking yourself. Because um, when it finds you, it might find you at 20, in your 30s where it found me 38. It might find you at 60, it might find you at 80. It might find you at 90, and you might live the best last year of your life. So thank you very much. Um, it did go a little bit over. We are open for questions for 13 minutes. Anything you want to throw at me, I'm, I'm at your service.
Thanks so much, Pepe. That was that was amazing. And uh, and and you can go on for another two. You can go on for another hour. I'm sure nobody will want to go anywhere. <laughs> uh, Guys, you can ask Pepe um, questions on the mic if you like, or or you could put it in the chat. But I, I, Pepe, I think it might be nice to just engage live on the mic, just unmute and 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 fire away. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'd like to go first if no one wants to go. Hi, Pepe. My name is Rachel. I just felt like the session was a bit short, and there's a lot to. It's a it's a big topic, you know. Uh, I don't think. You can really unpack it in a, in less than an hour, but um, interesting nonetheless. And I think for me personally, um, I've got this underlying fear, uh, lack of losing material, lack of um, fear of letting go, and I think it's deep in my subconscious somehow because I always try and reset that. But how do I reset this mindset so that I can move forward quickly? Okay, so I'm going to give you two, two, and thanks for that, Rachel. And you're so right. You know, this is a topic you need hours for, but 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 it's a good starting point. So consider that all of us, if we're fortunate enough to have parents, irrespective, I'm very well aware of my privileges, but even irrespective of where you come from, children on average will hear no and don't um, 48,000 times on average between the age of naught and six. And yes, you can, only 5,000 times. So you pretty much, all of us condition 10 to 1 to fail because we hear no and don't more than yes, you can. And it's not done maliciously. It's, it's just the way it is. It's, it's, it's what happens. Just watch how we speak to children. Watch how people speak to children. You'll hear no a lot more than amazing. And then consider that we go into a system that was designed to create factory workers. The educational system was factually designed to create factory thinking. And there's studies on that that shows that it dumbs us down. And it's deeply unconscious. So the first thing I want to tell you is becoming conscious of that. Just, just, the, just the awareness and the strength in an open forum to say, this is my struggle. That's the first step towards, towards fixing yourself. Because most of us will say, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. You know, even the person born into the most privileged home could have their parent not coming quick enough when they're crying as a baby. And in adult life, that child will either be overly needy or overly independent. And neither of those two extremes are healthy. So even when we think we're perfectly fine, we're really not. But life is good, so we don't question it. So... The first step is just the acknowledgement that you just made that I'm, I'm in fear of losing this. Like the, all those things you mentioned and start working with them. Um, it's not a quick fix. It really is not. I've been on this journey for 14 years. I've got so much more room for growth. I'm so far away from, from, from being like a, a really good solid person. I've got so many issues I'm working on, but but the starting point is to realize there's something greater within yourself and start and start looking for looking for answers. Um, start engaging with beautiful processes. You know, you get Nancy Klein's work, Time to Think, amazing. Brandon Bay's journey work, incredible. Um, uh, NLP, neuralistic, uh, neurolinguistic programming, magnificent work. Regression work into childhood. What went wrong? How can you fix those little things? It's a long journey. It's not a quick fix. There's no quick fix. And I think if it was a quick fix, it would be, it, it almost would be too easy. You know, I, I think this depth of life is what is what make us as special as each one of us are. We are extremely unique and special as human beings. Thank you. I just took some notes on the recommendations you've made and I guess it's part of the journey. Thank you so much. All good. Uh, Joel, you got your hand up. You can uh, just unmute and, and go for it. Cool. Thanks for that. 
So, yeah, I'm a small business owner doing my MBA with Henley now. Um, avid reader, loved shoe dog. Um, and this is where I'm at, right? So <laughs> after Varsity, my, my journey is a bit different. Believe it or not, I worked as a flight attendant. I wanted to travel. And in 05, I left and um, started my first business and failed hopelessly. And you know the journey. But I'm okay. I'm good now. Um, and I found something I love. Uh, we do skills development training. I'm passionate about it. I love it. And I can't get my head back in the game after Durban. After the events last month, you know, I got family in Durban. And I'm at that cutoff age. Do you emigrate? Do you not emigrate? And after all that, and finally getting some semblance of success, you know, I just can't get my head back in the game. How do you do that? How do you get your head? Because if you're South African, there's no way, whatever your opinion is, that you weren't affected by, by what happened, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I just can't get my head back in the game. Thanks. Thanks for that, Joel. And 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 hats off to you. I tell you, entrepreneurial journey is <laughs> it's one hell of a ride. I mean, I think it's one of the most loneliest journeys you can choose, and it is resilient. It's and, and in South Africa, eighty percent of small businesses fail um, by the by three years. So so to just to be in business. Um, is, is an incredible feat against all odds. So I said, I titled this, you know, purpose the anti serum to anything. And maybe you're sitting in this meeting tonight in the session and, and great to hear that you, you're already feeling that passion for service of others. But maybe, you know, I'm always open. If you want to pop me an email, um, I don't have a lot of time, but if you ever want to drop me an email, you can get my email from Barry and the team. Honestly, try and define the purpose of that business. Try and define it. Try and find the one word it stands for. You know, I made the example of beauty and that's skin deep and underneath it is something else. Try and define it and see if you found that and you, if that could give you the energy that you need to continue. Because of course, there's a lot of people that think like, like that. And I can tell you now, if I didn't have purpose, I'd probably be gone. But okay. it's my purpose. Okay. It's my purpose that absolutely keeps me on point in, my, in this country. Because I'm in this country to bring out the best in those around me. And I've got a vision for this country. And yeah. our business is just to grow people. And that's what, give, that's what keeps me in the game. So if, if you're struggling to get back into the game, maybe this is a bit of a, maybe this is the universe giving you a bit of a, a, sho a little bit of a bump, a little bit of a yeah. shove, like a gave yeah. shove in 2007, a huge freaking shove. I mean, I was yeah. bankrupt, yeah. man. I had nothing. <laughs> no, cool. Thanks. I'll get your email from Barry. Thanks. Yes, please. Let's engage. Cool, man. Cool, man. Uh, I think I saw somebody's hand up. It's gone away. Is it? Okay, is it... okay Barry, can I, can, I, can I go? Hey, Paul. Yes. Sorry, just came in. Oh, no, go ahead, Paul. I'll jump off to you. All right. Okay. So I'll make mine very brief. Okay, Pepe, um, I've enjoyed every bit of um, what you've said today, but I just wanted to ask a question. Yeah. How can you achieve a purpose when the goal of achieving that purpose lies in the hands of other people who do not share the same purpose with you? For instance, I just came in from an election and you find out that you so love your people, you're out there to serve, you've done everything to do, but then the system of people without the right purpose are just trying to frustrate that effort. And so my question would be, how do you achieve a purpose when you know it's contingent upon other people being in line, being in sync with the reality that you are trying to bring on board to change the lives of people? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's such a good question. That's such a good question. Because, of course, being the founder of our business, I can create traction in the business quicker because I'm at an exec level. Um, so, so I, and I hear exactly what you're saying. So, and, and, and then, of course, you've got personal purpose and you might find yourself in a place and, that, and, and everything's pushing against that purpose. So, so that's kind of how I'm reading the question. Now, there's, on an organizational level, if, if, if I felt, 
So if, if my personal purpose is, my one word is greatness, it does not mean I'm a great guy. It just means I'm here to bring up greatness in others. That's my, that's my duty. That's my mission. That's my purpose. Now, if I find myself in an organization that I can't bring that purpose to life, I should leave that organization. I should move on. Or I could say to myself, but hang on, without darkness, there's no need for light. So if you're a light worker, in order to have purpose, you need darkness. And the more darker, the greater your purpose. So I would then potentially rationalize to myself, instead of trying to aim too big, I'm going to start small. So if I'm an organization of 30,000 people who's absolutely not aligned to my purpose and my values, but I might find there's a team of five around me that are. And I'll start affecting those, those people around me. And I think together the six of us can start affecting another six around us. And over time, I could potentially create profound change. But I have the choice. I can either try and do that or I can just move into another situation. If it's at a country level, like this country, I don't want to leave. So I'm going to stick it through till they put me in a box or until ESCOM completely runs out of power and switch the lights off and then I'll go. But, but until then, I'm going to give it my absolute everything. So the beautiful thing is about purpose and probably also vision, because one affects the other, they work together, that it doesn't really matter if you ever achieve what you're aiming for. It really doesn't as long as you live every day towards that end goal. So if I want to change this country and I want to fix education, and I really believe I might just do it in this lifetime, you never know. If I get to the end of my life and I knew every single day I did my best to achieve that and I don't achieve it, it's not going to matter because I would have lived an incredible life. So, so I do think it is a choice and you do have a choice to stay in a situation or out, but be mindful that that if you're really in the world to give light, you're often going to be put in dark situations. And I do think this country of ours, this South African country, I don't know where you're from, but whichever country we planted in, we've got a role to play. It doesn't matter how small. You know, there's no difference in the organization between the CEO and the receptionist. They are equally profound in the roles they play. Similar in the country. But thanks for that question. It's a, it's a great question. Um, Pepe, let's, let's take up Katleko's question and then and then let, and we'll we'll close down after that. Uh, but what I would like to suggest, maybe with a show of hands, is uh, I, I think uh, we should get Pepe back, you know, in a few months uh, when when he's got time, and do a part two because I think there's a lot more to talk about here. We haven't we haven't had enough time. So um, Pepe, so, sorry to put you on the spot, but let's see what. Uh, Let's see, if, yeah. you know, if, if, we, if we can find our, find our way back here in a couple of months, that'd be wonderful. That would be amazing. Um, because I also think there's a bunch of people here that's going to affect a bunch of other people in their lives, you know, and, and there's potential insight there. Well, you've got a resounding show of hands there, so right. it's on. Um, Katleko, we're going we're gonna to close with your questions, so you go ahead. Thank you, Barry. Uh, I just want to say, Pepe, thank you so much for the talk, man. And uh, the Shoe Dog book is actually a phenomenal one. It's the first time where I've read it. Um, and then my wife saw me giggling, smiling, as if I'm watching a movie, that she was jealous that she also had to read it, you know, as soon as I was done. Very powerful book. Um, and I think my question is just that, you know, recently uh, I attended a workshop where they were just speaking about the six, you know, sources of influence and if you want to change anything, you need to focus on that. Um, and the truth is, you know, for someone who has now found their purpose at 38, why do you think is it that, you know, a lot of people know what they need to change, but still don't do it? So it's almost like you saying, yes, there's the human side to it, but the being means that you just need to act out and put, you know, the plan in motion. What do you think holds a lot of people back, especially as someone who leads a creative business. Yeah. I, I honestly believe what holds us back is that we are asleep. We really are. 
Um, and I know that because let me tell you something that's interesting. So being a huge party animal, life of the party, my wife wanted to stop drinking. And I said to her, if you stop drinking, I divorce you because that's such a massive part of my life. Now, when I became conscious, I stopped drinking. You know, I once saw a person that didn't drink and I said, you cannot trust that person. I said to a friend of mine, you can't trust that person because he doesn't drink. I think we are so deeply entrenched in certain paradigms. Um, you know, often, often if I'm born into a Christian home, I become a Christian. If I'm born into Afrikaans home, I eat rice flakes and artapels and I vote for the national party. You know, and and you know, and and all the other horrible things that could potentially go with it. And then I think I think for myself, but actually I'm just regurgitating the thinking of my little clan that I was born into. And you can apply this to anyone, not just to white Afrikaans guy. So I, I honestly feel because I'm speaking from a point of view. I mean, I went to the army for two years. I was in Angola in a war. I didn't even know what I was fighting for. I mean, how do you not ask why must I go there? I mean, a child of five say, why? Why? There you go. You must go to the army. I don't even ask why. Just go. I was a complete sheep. So I think, and I don't think it's by own making, and I don't think we're bad people. We, we are all incredible human beings, but we are just a little bit asleep. And that's why I'm, I like to think as traumatic as COVID is, and it's affected a lot of people around me. We just had the friend of my sister die today. Um, so there's a lot of trauma with it. But I think it is really there to shake us a little bit. How many of us will continue to wake up? I don't know. But, but I think it's just very deep unconscious conditioning. And the best thing we can do is actually get back to being children again. Start asking why. Why? Why must I go to school? <laughs> or, you know, why? Just start asking why. Um, and then, of course, we're creatures of habit. We don't like change. We really don't. And maybe another thing to start working on, like I've got growth mindset and people sometimes think I'm, I'm overly humble um, because I've achieved quite a lot, but I'm not. I'm just, I've got huge growth mindset and, and every day is a day of growth and I'm only as good as my last job and then I want to do better. I hope that helped. Um, but, but again, as I said earlier on, everything is just, it's the way it is. And I think the world is designed to evolve us to higher consciousness. Um, and we're going to get there. I don't know in this lifetime, but we're going to work towards getting there. Thanks for that, Pepe. Appreciate it. Awesome, man. Pepe, I think, uh, should we... Should we count it? Should we count down now and um, and and agree to find another place to pick up from where we just left off? And I know that uh, you have some some other inspiration, is you know inspiring and equally profound stories. So I'd I'd love to hear them all. So let's see if we can we can get you back in a couple of months. I'd love that. I'd really love that. And maybe it would be one that maybe three. Three stories, get out of it quicker and get into questions because I think questions are actually super enriching. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Love that. Yeah. I love that. But I think it was really important to set the table like you did today. So that was, uh, that was just beautiful. Thank you very much.